Well, good evening, y'all. I feel very honored to be back at Georgia Tech after four years at a podium. And I, I must say that uh, retiring after 44 years here, it was just when I was beginning to get the hang of it. <laughs> okay. uh, the first poem I'm going to read is entitled One at the Counter. I, I often uh, eat in restaurants and I often go alone, which means if the restaurant has a counter, that's where I have to sit. Uh, in Miami Beach, where I grew up, uh, there was a restaurant called Wolfie's. Uh, it was a New York deli type restaurant, one of my favorites. And if it was crowded that evening, you had to stand in line according to the number of people in your party. There were lines for four, lines for three, lines for two, uh, lines for five or more. That's, that was for the big booths. And then off to the side, uh, there was a line for one, one at the counter. And eating in that kind of situation always made me think of something Tennessee Williams once said. And that is, we are all of us sentenced to solitary confinement for life within the prisons of our own skins. And uh, eating along at the counter, you sort of feel the weight of that. <laughs> so, so this is one at the counter. And I do have a, a kind of college level uh, reference that I should probably explain to the freshmen here. <laughs> uh, I, I refer to Ceres, the Greek goddess of the harvest. Uh, our word cereal is related to her name, Ceres, C-E-R-E-S. It's Demeter in the Roman mythology. And she's always depicted carrying sheaves of grain. And in this poem, the hostess in the restaurant is carrying menus. So I'll make the, the obvious comparison. <laughs> One at the counter. Fecund with the dinner crush, uh, the pungent restaurant breeds lines of salivating customers, edging past each other toward the heavy velvet rope. Nostrils sting, but eyes are fixed upon the hostess, her svelte form swinging through the hickory smoke, laden with menus like series once removed. Her clacker clicking like a castanet, her fingers dart the numbers. The chosen diners pass the rope, promoted from purgatory. <laughs> Fours and twos move swiftest. They laugh as they sidle past the hungry threes. <laughs> Strange figure, unprofitable to feed at a square table. The booths are for the fives and sixes. Their company reverberates with wisecracks, effacing tedium. The ones are in a separate line, strangers to this mirth. Like monks, they brood apart. A quiet chorus, musing on the rhythms of the crowd. They know the end of waiting. Not the golden plush of the cushion booths, nor the spacious camaraderie of the laughing tables, but unescorted by the goddess hostess, the cloistered silence of the counter seats. <laughs> it's a lonely existence. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right, my next poem is called First Reader, and uh, for those people who submit poetry, that does not refer to the first reader in the editorial office who, who hawks your poem and sends it back with the rejections. So, uh, the first reader here is the book, uh, the primer, uh, for people in the first, uh, uh, pupils in the first grade. And you, you know the setup, uh, uh, see spot run, that kind of thing. Well, in my poem, the uh, the boy and girl were named Peggy and Peter, as you'll soon find. And it is a, uh, page 50, no. it's set up with a series of statements from the book, uh, followed by a set of questions to the student about those statements. Very simple. This is a boy. This is a girl. The boy's name is Peter. The girl's name is Peggy. A, one, 
What is the boy's name? Two, what is the girl's name? Three, how long did their names last? Four, draw what Peggy sees in the mirror. Peter has a dog. Peggy has a cat. The dog's name is Rover. The cat's name is Tags. B, one, what is the dog's name? Two, what is the cat's name? Three, can you find a clock in the picture? Four, what time does it say? Rover is gnawing a bone. Tags is playing with yarn. Rover is burying the bone. Tags is tangled in the yarn. C, one, does Peter bury the bone? Two, where is Peter buried? <laughs> Three, does Peggy play with the yarn? Four, where does Peggy play now? D, one, do you have a dog? Two, do you have a cat? Three, when did you play last? Four, tell the class where you are buried. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're amused by that. <laughs> okay. The uh, next poem is another Miami Beach poem. It's called The Lesson and it's about being stung by a man of war. Uh, you don't have to be a marine biologist to know that they sting like hell. Uh, not to be confused with the jellyfish. They both float on the water, but they're very different sea creatures. The, uh, the man of war, often called the Portuguese man of war, I think that's where it comes from, floats across the Atlantic, winds up on the shores uh, of the Atlantic. Uh, uh, in our country. Uh, it's a beautiful sea creature. It's got purple and fuchsia and maroon and every shade of, of burgundy. It's incredible the number of shades of blue and purple and pink you see in that creature. But as I say, it stings like fury. So what do we have here? We have a, uh, but what is the lesson? That something beautiful can be very painful. So if you're in love with the beautiful girl, uh, think about that. Uh, or a handsome boy, same thing. Gender equity, we had to take a course in that. <laughs> here at Tech, <laughs> so I want to be careful. <laughs> the lesson. I was stung by a man of war when I was four. It spun purple tentacles about my thigh. And though I cried, I saw its glistening Portuguese sail, a sack of poison, acid majesty. I know royalty when I see its barbed embroidery, <laughs> the formic wine within the purple grail. Uh, formic, you know, was the acid that they uh, put insects in. <laughs> it, it, it comes from, from insects, formic acid. The formic wine within the purple grill. Something so beautiful can hold such deadly material. Now, there's a personal anecdote that goes with that, aside from being stung by a man of war. I was the, uh, the guest poet in Miami uh, in 1968 at Bayfront Park. And the, the columnist, one of the columnists for the Miami Herald, Charles Whited, who had a daily column that ran the whole length of the left-hand side of page 1B every day, uh, called me for an interview on the phone before the uh, reading. And he wanted a poem as part of the interview. He wanted a poem. So this is the one I read over the phone to him. And he read it back to me. And it sounded perfectly correct. And that night, it was Saturday night, uh, it was supposed to be in the, in the Sunday paper, and they had the street edition of the Sunday paper out on Saturday night. I was just waiting by the box to, to, to see my, my interview, how it came out, and everything was fine, except in the poem, that line, it spun purple tentacles about my thigh, came out in the newspaper. It spun purple tentacles about my thing. <laughs> Ye gods, <laughs> you know, I, I called immediately, I got, I got on the horn and I spoke to the copy editor and he said, boy, that's a good one. <laughs> but the, he changed it in time for the, for the morning edition that went into people's homes. It wasn't all that, but there isn't anybody under 13 here, is there? 
I've got some racy stuff coming up. <laughs> well, okay. All right, those of you who submit poetry uh, may relate to this one. It's called God Opens His Mail. And it's a letter. Uh, if, if God had submitted his universe, he might not get a nasty letter from the editors. Uh, I, I submitted for years before I had an acceptance. And the, some of them occasionally wrote a little squib on the rejection slip. Uh, keep trying. You have much to learn, but your talent will help. We really don't have time for this sort of thing. <laughs> so if God submitted his universe to these editors, this is the kind of letter he might get back. God opens his mail. Dear sir, your poem interested us somewhat. But, but we do not consider it entirely successful. For one thing, your floral diction blooms in the right places, but there are bugs which seem almost deliberately placed. Then again, life flares everywhere in your work, yet you cancel it later in the lines. With a disdain, no artist with a trace of self-respect would dare to show not to mention compassion for the child of his brain, but let that pass. Do you have a friend who might perhaps be willing to read your work before you send it out? <laughs> Just a suggestion, but beginners must be guided, this being God's first university. Another thing, your images, though ple pleasant taken singly, fail to fuse properly. We find a, a sly intent to suggest an overall design. And yet the reader sees no real organic whole. Your metaphors stand isolated. No poem can carry such disparities as shooting stars and glory holes, no matter how securely yoked. Uh, creation carries certain responsibilities, and we are unconvinced you have accepted these. There are other problems, of course, but our staff is limited and time is short. You have, we feel, much to earn, but your talent will help. Cordially, the editors. P.S. Since half the battle is knowing your market, uh, perhaps you would care to subscribe. <laughs> the final twist. <laughs> uh, Tom just read a poem about Emily Dickinson, or a passage of one of my poems about Emily Dickinson. I'm going to read another one in her voice. Uh, she's my favorite poet. Emily Dickinson on etiquette, uh, this is called. And one thing you must know about Emily Dickinson, she was a very private person, and also she was, or two things, she was also uh, very unconventional in her view of God. Uh, she considered the, the cathedral, uh, her cathedral was the woods, and so, and so on. Uh, one of her poems goes, uh, some keep the Sabbath by going to church, and, but she goes to the woods and she says, God, a noted clergyman, gives a service, gives a sermon. So this is my poem on that subject, Emily Dickinson on etiquette. If God came calling at my house, I'd ask him in for tea and comment on the lovely day that brought such deity. I'd ask him were his angels well, and if his saints had dined, somehow I'd steer the table talk on well-accepted lines. But should he fail to take the hint and probe my soul in two, I'd rise a little formally and end the interview. <laughs> you can just see Emily Dickinson dismissing God. I can see it. <laughs> Okay, that, that was all for my first book. I'll move. If, listen, if I run over, please hit the gong or whatever. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, here's a Georgia Tech poem. Uh, Saturday afternoon, it's called. It's about a football game. Oddly enough, Grant Field is right next to us here. Uh, to give a little background on this poem, we used to have Saturday morning classes, believe it or not. Uh, from 1955 when I started till 1968, I believe it was, uh, there were Saturday morning classes. The last one was at 12 noon. 
that had it. One, nobody liked it, but uh, there were Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes, and Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday classes. But along about 1968, well over 100 years after the founding of the Institute, uh, the administrators uh, figured out that if they made the Tuesday-Thursday classes an hour and a half, they wouldn't have to have Saturday classes. So it was a mathematical <laughs> jump they, they had to make. All right, so I was driving to Tech on a Saturday morning uh, for my class when I past Patterson's Funeral Home here on uh, 10th and Spring. And there, there's an exit from the freeway there. And there was a game that afternoon, and people were coming already. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of cars coming off the ramp uh, at 10th and Spring. And meanwhile, there was a funeral trying to come out of the drive of Patterson's Funeral Home. <laughs> and they got mixed up. The cars. In, in the funeral cortege got mixed up with the cars going to the game, which seemed to me to be a perfect opportunity to write a poem. And, uh, life and death, try to fuse life and death. Uh, the game is life and the funeral is death, obviously. Saturday afternoon, rolling off the freeway, the football crowd got tangled with a funeral, diluting death till only the hearse could find the road. The cars with lights got lost amidst the rush to kickoff time. And whether some lucky mourners found themselves in bleacher seats, the Sunday papers never said. Absence is a minor thing at funerals. Yet touchdowns aren't really less eternal. Tackles fall and ovals fly, yet something in the autumn air isn't like a game. The cheers roll on to victory, the poles come down, the hero slides off the shoulders of the crowd. Somewhere above the stadium, the shouts dissolve, and all the players dash through a little door hidden in a cellar wall. Beyond the line of scrimmage and early dusk means headlights must go on all the same. Some may have missed the first handful of dirt, but there was sod enough upon that measured field. Only buried captains know how many cubic yards. I have to come down hard on that word cubic because it's supposed to open up the football field to a third dimension. <laughs> it becomes a burial ground. Maybe I was just jealous I wasn't on the football team. <laughs> but buried captains will know how many cubic yards. Uh, let me see. I'm, I'm going to move on to my third book so as not to run over too much. Oh, Geometry Test, 10th grade. I, I read this at a rather elegant prep school in Chattanooga back around 1978, I think it was. And it created a minor sensation when I explained that it was about having your first orgasm during a 10th grade geometry test. <laughs> Just t t too much tension there. <laughs> Geometry test, 10th grade. 30 minutes we had to prove the theorem. For 20, I sat staring at circles, my inner angles frozen when nothing came out equal. The bisectors I drew were tilted wrong, while fear of the circular face of time stiffened my blood like clock hands tracing arcs I never knew existed. Suddenly that curve stretched perpendicular, longer than my longest transverse line, reaching beyond the limits of the page. And the tallest segments of the intersected cone slit the seal of infinity. My mind was washed like windshields after rain, and circles glided smoothly into place, the arcs connecting in their shrunken frames. I left that room, all theorems proved. <laughs> OK, on page 19, uh, here's one about teaching at Georgia Tech. Uh, when I, for the first decade that I taught here, it was all boys. So I refer to my sons here. The title of the poem is The Bachelor as Professor. 
And incidentally, I, I had a, an Italian colleague who has since passed on, Ralph Bergamo, a dear friend who was from Italy, or had an Italian background. He told me the word bachelor in Italian is il escapolo, literally, the one who has escaped. <laughs> the bachelor as professor. My sons are always young. The liquid flowers of their eyes may change, but the light remains. Their names are always on the chart, spelled differently year by year. In roll books of my mind, I can correct what seems irregular. I cannot age. Waves of time dissolve that flare of faces every spring, yet the waters bloom again with eyes. I swim toward them, an athlete at last. Though I reach for them invisibly, in voice, any bell is strong enough to break that bond. But when they're safe at home and sipping soup and telling body parents how they mean to thrive, their eyes are fixed upon unborn designs. Their words are mine. The triumph of the teacher. <laughs> Their words are mine. Okay, I'm going to finish up with just a couple more. Uh, this one is called Registered at the Bordello Hotel. Uh, page 21. Uh, this is my new book. Now a word from our sponsor. This is the book that's on sale. <laughs> okay, Unanswered Calls. Registered at the Bordello Hotel. In Vienna, uh, where I spend summers uh, pretty often, uh, I stay at a hotel that had a reputation back in the late 50s and 60s when I started going over there as what they call in Vienna a Stunde Hotel. If you know German, you know S-T-U-N-D-E. Uh, a Stunde is an hour. Uh, <laughs> yes. But they were very discreet. ...and being in such an env environment. Uh, you know what the beautiful thing about being a Puritan is? It takes so little to give you a kick. <laughs> right. Registered at the Bordello Hotel, Vienna. You hand me my key with a smile like a starched sheet. I wait for the lift with eyes averted from the halls. The silence is a secret known to flies and gods. The 27 steps to my room, I walk past doors locked against my wildly growing hands. The smell of human dust sifts through the crevices with laughter echoed in coiled twangs. I throw the bolt and hide. All night the stars consult about my case. By dawn, all rooms are empty. Between my stainless sheets, I sleep in the sweat of a single heart. So. Oh, that reminds me of a line from a, another poem. Ruby Fogel, a Miami Beach poet, had a poem, uh, advice to a young poet. And it gives the usual advice and then ends with a dynamite ending. Uh, after the usual advice, keep your eyes open, do this, do that. The last line is, and sleep alone. <laughs> who was it, Balzac, who, who believed that sexual energy went into his writing? And if he had uh, sex, he would say, uh oh, there goes another novel. <laughs> okay. Okay. The editors, 42. Uh, here's one. I've, I've got two short ones left. Actually, all my poems are pretty short. Uh, this is called The Editors. Again, if you have submitted poetry, uh, you know some of the heartache. Uh, you have to have a hide like an elephant or a hippopotamus or a nuss or something. Uh, the Editors. This, I had the editors of The New Yorker in mind when I, I wrote this. Uh, the, the poems in The New Yorker at this time, in, in the late 50s and 60s, uh, tended to publish poems about spring 
and gardens in the suburbs and uh, all sorts of nicey nice things, well-crafted poems, but not terribly emotionally powerful, I thought. So I, I would be sending poems about death and, <laughs> and I'd be coming back right away. Uh, the editors, a morbid concern with death, they said, and sent the poems back, picturing the runt who wrote, checking daily on his morning cancer. They preferred concern with squirrels in spring and mating habits along suburban lakes, mustard seeds and pearls, and little boats that row around the Cape. Readers like to muse upon the girl who swings her crossed leg in the college library and what she's really thinking. When autumn comes, the squirrels have nuts enough, the mustard seeds have bloomed, the pearls are strung, the oysters in the boat, the girl with legs has long been satisfied. A morbid concern with death, they said, and died. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna wind up with a poem about the Emory University Library, the old one, uh, not the new one, uh, not the Woodruff, but the old Candler Library, where they had a, an interesting change in policy about the time I got my BA there uh, and became a graduate student. Up to the point where I got my BA, they had closed off the stacks to the undergraduates. At the time I became a graduate student, they opened it up to the undergraduates. And I was working hard on my thesis. And, so on, and in the carols, you know, those little single desk study cubicles down there. And I would notice that sometimes two people would be seated in a one-person cubicle. <laughs> and they may have been doing research, but it wasn't in their books. <laughs> also, you must know that the old Emory Library, the Candler Library, had three levels, three basement levels. And it, it was going back in time chronologically, and also it was getting darker and darker as you went down. So you can imagine. A note on, oh, there is a reference to Abelard and Eloise in this poem, 12th century French lovers. Uh, at one point after their affair, after her uncle castrated them, uh, their letters are one of the world's great books, the letters of Abelard and Eloise, one of the classics. It's on the Harvard shelf. Classics. But in one of the letters, Abelard reminds her when they were lovers, uh, I was her tutor, he says, and we, our hands were more often in each other's bosoms than in our books. So, so there's a touch of that here. A note on library policy. We should never have opened the stacks to the undergraduates. It's become their favorite trysting place. Like crafty abelards, they hide their fingers underneath their books and pluck at Eloise. They swarm, they kiss in cubicles. For all we know, they breed down there in the 12th century. <laughs> That's where the bulbs are broken. The sack boys have to use flashlights on that level. But they never report anything amiss, sworn to secrecy, probably. It's most distracting. How is one to annotate his bibliography when everywhere he finds these naked couples hiding deep in depthless carols? I know, they try to be quiet, but every now and then a girl will laugh. Warm and moist, the sound floats up between the cracks of the neoclassic shelves, and when one is trying to correlate very inversions, well, really. Thank you. Thank you.